right? Uh, you may have a neighbor who is doing certain things that are antithetical to what it is that you're striving to live on at your homestead. You know, you may be a man who's teaching your wife and your children and you're, you're constantly pouring into them the ways and, and, and the statutes of righteousness in order to align them. You know, you're constantly, because children should constantly, daily, be taught, you know, the ways of, of the creator every single day. And it, it, just make it fun. If you have to make it fun, make it fun, but don't neglect the day to teach your children, you know, about about what the creator is and what the creator's intention is uh, on this planet, right, or in this planet. So you may be doing that every single day, and you have a neighbor that is just about something else. Maybe they're arguing all the time, and you hear the argument coming through the walls or, or across the yard, you know, maybe there's police in front of the house every other day because there's something wild happening there. You know, um, maybe it's just the things that they cook. It could be the smells that are, come across, are coming across the yard. It could be the music that they play. It could be um, the way they, they um, treat their animals. Or it could be the behavior of their children and the effect that that may have on your children. It could be the lifestyle or the sex style that they live that now um, creates a certain influence across your own homestead. So who you live near is a critical choice for you men because you men should be the masters of your homestead and you should be considering that when you're buying a place. Well, who are the neighbors? Other communities consider that. You know, uh, when we say locate the three most important things in real estate, location, 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 you know, that's cold word because, <laughs> because, you know, any location could be great. That's what we see projects get gentrified. At one point, that was a terrible location. So it's not really the location. It's people. What people are here? You know, so it's very important, obviously, as men, when you're choosing places to live and you're, you're situa- situ- situating your family that you're ensuring that the environment is reflective of the principles and the mores that you stand for. So for us as a new, I'm only interested really in living near our new people. And if I'm not, then um, I prefer a lot of space around me. So I don't necessarily have to be disturbed by the culture and lifestyle of other people, nor do I have to disturb them with my culture and lifestyle. I don't want to be a bully to anyone or to be intolerable because someone has their own way and their own path. And I, and I never would want to, you know, impose, I never want to impose my path on someone else. Uh, but if we all are thinking the same and living the same and striving towards the same cultural values, then, you know, we could, it could be four of us sharing one room together, <laughs> you know, it's, it's okay. So, um, with that being said, like I said, a lot of times it's a desire and there's a move for separation, as there should be. Any great leader that has ever come across our path has preached the values of separation and segregation. Okay? So, or, and, if, and if they did not at first, they eventually did. Okay? There's a value in being able to create contrast, contrast and distinction. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're looking to subdue anyone or um, you're even you're even trying to impose a, a sense of superiority. Just be, you're touching things that you haven't even had to respect enough to, to understand, but you want effect. And this is how you get you get a cursed life through your disobedience because you reject knowledge. You see. You reject knowledge. And then because you reject knowledge, you create intergenerational curses. You know, that's why, you know, people will will speak about something like diabetes. Oh, diabetes runs in my family. Diabetes doesn't, doesn't run in your family. You know, it's just that uh, you've now been the recipi- recipient of an intergenerational curse of ignorance. That's all. 
because your forefathers and your, well, I'm going to say your forefathers. I won't even blame it on your foremothers. Uh, your forefathers rejected knowledge. You know, there was information that came to them at one point that could have positively affected their health. And they decided to ignore it. They decided to reject it. I've always eaten like this. I've been eating the hog all my life. I've been eating this fried chicken good. I'm eating dirty, but I'm eating good. You know, all these little stupid phrases that people say. And then what happens is uh, as they move forward, they pass the torch to you. And you could you could uh, not take the torch. You could choose to do that, but you choose to take the torch. So now the curse has been has been carried forward. It's been transmitted to you. You see, that's the intergenerational curse. It's not that someone did something to you back in the old country, you know, and because they don't like your family. Because the majority of the time when people come to me with that and I say, well, what, what could you have done for someone to want to do that much work against you? I don't know. I don't know. Or, or my, my ex... Narcissism is rampant in the cultural communities. You think people um, have that much time and that much that many, that much resource to just sit and keep doing work against you, like you're that important. But you know, it's because you don't want to take accountability for what you have caused. Sometimes, what you've caused in the lives of others, like those ex lovers, like your children, but also what you've caused in your own life. Because you reject knowledge. You reject knowledge. So now you pass on intergenerational curses to your children and your grandchildren. 